Hi guys, in this particular recording, we are going to go through amino acids and talk about optical isomerism. So amino acids is one of those really, really unique function groups um, because it contains two, com uh, two function groups. So if you look at the name amino acid, it kind of gives it away, okay? And then if you do biology, you understand that amino acids are the building block of life because that make up protein, you know, that make up DNA and all that sort of wonderful stuff, okay? So this is, um, you know, this is where biology and chemistry start to sort of shake hands and go into biochemistry, um, you know, which is definitely not a, not an easy subject to do at university, okay? So if you look at amino acids, amino means when you have a carbon bonding to nitrogen, acid, if you think about what we did to have acid in chemistry, is carboxylic acid. So what it means is that you will have got a um, let's just give you an example of a carboxylic, um, sorry, amino acid. Um, will look something like like this. Okay, so this is an example of a simple amino acid. So amino means you have got amino part. So this section is the amino part. This section is the acid part. Okay, so this is where amino. This is your carb carboxylic acid. So you just have um, two function groups in one and they are equally important in this particular case. So we know that A means this is a base or alkaline and we know that carboxylic acid is obviously acidic. Okay, so this is acidic and um, because it, it just says, right? COH is a weak, is a weak acid. So something that um, that uh, that a um, an amino acid will actually do in a chemical reaction, you know, among itself, is that the acid and base all react together. Um, so what it means is that the base this receive, they want to receive H plus, okay, and then your acidic part want to donate H plus. So this is when you will actually have, in this case, the nitrogen on the on the left hand side. So what has happened is that a transfer of this hydrogen onto that nitrogen. So this COOH is acting as an acid, and then the end the, the nitrogen is acting as a base. So the nitrogen gained another hydrogen, so it became NH3 plus, and then the COOH lost the H plus, so it becomes COO minus. And this is called a Zwitter ion. Okay, so it's it's a very stable structure. And that's why amino acids tend to be quite stable. And you know, in this particular way, they're not as reactive because you know it lost, um, it, it has already reacted by giving away the um, by giving away the H from the acidic part and then the alkaline part picked up the H plus, okay? So that's, you know, all there is in terms of amino acids. I mean, we can talk more about um, the reactions in terms of doing condensation polymerization, which I'll do in a separate video because that's the most important part of this particular section. Um, and that tends to be the most difficult part. Okay, so, but I do want to talk about use of amino acids to introduce the idea of optical isomers. Okay, so we've done isomers um, before, so we have done structural isomers. So structural isomers is when you have, um, structural isomers is when you have same molecular formula. So that means you have the same type of atoms and you have the same number of each type of atoms, but you got different structures, okay? So they are arranged differently. So something they like asking in the exam, especially in CA, is that they, they will give you the structural isomer, they will say like something like C5H11OH, for example, and they will go, okay, so one of those isomer will do such, 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 which produce another molecule, which will do such, such, such. So you actually need to know the chemical reactions really well to do that type of equation. And those tend to be the, I personally think the most difficult part of the, of the whole standard in um, level three organic, um, which we'll get there when we have a chance. Okay, so this is structural isomers. 
And then we talked about geometric isomers, geometric isomers, which is previous year's work. So this is when you have a CC double bond and then the two groups bonding to the carbons in the double bond must be different. So these two things must be different. These two things must be different. And then if you got the same thing on the same side, it's cis, opposite side is trans. Okay, so that's, that's previous year stuff. And optical isomers, also known as enantiomers, this is where you must have what we call a chiral carbon. Okay, so you must have a chiral carbon in order to have optical isomers or enantiomers. So what is a chiral carbon? A chiral carbon is, is a carbon that's bonded to four different groups of atoms. Okay, so it, it's bonding, it just means that the things that's bonding to this particular carbon must be different. So this is where amino acids can come into place quite handily. So if I just do this, let's just pick one now. I mean, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be a, um, an amino acid. It could be a lot of other functional groups. Um, so I hope it's really obvious that this carbon is the optical, uh, it's a chiral carbon. Okay, so it can never be carbon that's bonding to same thing. So CH3 is ruled out. It can't be this carbon because you have a double bond. So you must have a carbon that's single bonded to four different groups of atoms. So if you look at this carbon, it's bonding to CH3, which is different to the H, which is different to the NH2, which is different to the COOH. Okay, so that means this particular carbon is my chiral carbon. And once you got your chiral carbon, you can actually draw the optical isomers. And this is how it works. Now, it doesn't, so as you can see, you, you are kind of like just drawing the tetrahedral shape. So it doesn't matter what these four things are. You can just think of it as tetrahedral that you learned in previous years. So you can just call it A, B, C, D. You can do A, B, um, da, 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 C, and then D. You can just it doesn't matter what A, B, C, D are, they are just different things um, that's bonded to the carbon and you just want to put it in a, in, a, in a tetrahedral shape. Okay, so we can rearrange it to whatever way you want, but especially the first diagram that you draw. Um, so let's do an H2, and let's do uh, hydrogen. Okay, so if I draw it like that, so the first one you can literally free, you know, freely do whatever you want. You can put the CH3 over here. It doesn't matter where you put it. Okay, the first one doesn't matter. But optical isomers means that, you know, optical isomers, so optic, they'll come in uh, a bit handy. The basic example of optical isomers, um, because we, I'm doing this online, I can actually show you, is that you can simply look at your hands. All right, so if you look at your two hands, your two hands should be identical. You know, they are mirror images of each other. So if you put a mirror in the middle, you know, your fingers are, you know, your hands are mirror images of each other. But if you put one hand over the other, like, you know, or facing down, and if you put one hand over the other, they are non superimposable. So that means they can't exactly overlay one another perfectly. Okay, so that's what optical isomer is. So that means, so you can think of this, you know, the diagram on the left as your left hand. And then the right hand side, uh, your right hand will just be exactly the same, but it is a mirror image of what you have drawn on the left hand side. Okay, so it doesn't matter what you like. So, so if you were drawing this from the beginning, this one that we have on the left can look whatever way it wants. All right, and obviously you need to draw in a tetrahedral, tetrahedral shape, but it like say for example, I don't have to put the H here. I can don't have to put the NH two there. You can put them whatever way you want to put them. But then whatever you do, the one that you draw on the right hand side must be a mirror image of the one that you have on the left. Okay, so these are the if you have a chiral carbon. 
if you have a carbon that's bonded to four different groups and this will give rise to um, mirror images um, so the, the isomers are mirror images of each other they are non superimposable okay so to, again just if, if you ever forget about this in the exam just look at your hands look at your writing hands as with you know they're non superimposable um, and that will produce two optical isomers okay so you get a pair of optical isomers that they will look slightly different I mean if you look at hands you know very identical but the orientation is a bit different okay so how do we actually distinguish these so let's go through some of these examples okay so let's see if any of these have chiral carbons or and then if they can give rise to optical isomers and then we can draw them out okay so for example if we look at the first one um, straight away no because you can't you need to have four different groups and if they're double bonded it doesn't work okay um, and this carbon no because you got three H's so three H's straight away no um, this carbon yes um, so you got let's use a different color um, so you got this carbon that's bonded to BR which is different to CL which is different to H which is different to OH so if I were to draw it you can just draw it again I, I, I'll just draw it this way just to make my point just to make my point Okay, so this is da, 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 da. and then the one on the right must be mirror images of what you got on the left. Okay, and then see if this one has any chiral carbon. So, so remember when you see CH three, it can't be it. When you see CH twos, CH threes, this one's can't be it. So this carbon is your chiral carbon. Why is that? Because this carbon is bonding to an H, bonding to an H two, bonding to a CH three, bonding to a CH two CH three. So this has chiral carbon, which has optical isomers. Um, and this carbon here, so this carbon, nope, this carbon, nope, this carbon, nope, 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 nope. Okay, so you just look at what it is bonding to. Are they bonding to the same thing? So as the moment they have double bonds, they can't. The moment they have more than one H is bonded to it, they can't, okay? Um, and this one straight away, I can see it right there. This is my chiral carbon. Okay, because this is bonding to an H, CH3, an H2, and COOH. That's my chiral carbon right there in the middle. And then this one right here, this carbon. Um, so sometimes you may want to draw them out like that just to get a visual image of what they look like. And then this one right there is a chiral carbon. Okay, because it's bonding to, you might go it's bonding to C and C. No, you need to look at the whole thing. This is bonding to CH2, CH3. This is bonding to CH3. This is bonding to H. This is bonding to OH. Okay, so this has kind of come. So optical isomers, you just need to be really aware. So when they, you know, it may look really simple. You may go, okay, so what's so how? So how with that? It, it's not difficult. But you need to understand how the carbon... Um, you know, when they give you um, a structural isomer, I think I'll, I should definitely go through one of those questions when, at the end of the topic, is that when you get a, when they give you a structural isomer and they go, okay, molecule A, one of the isomers is molecule A. And molecule A can have um, optical isomers. So straight away, you need to manipulate the, the, the diagram so you can have a chiral carbon, you know, and there, there aren't too many options. Um, in that regard okay so that's one of the thing key things about optical isomers you need to have the chiral carbon which gives rise to the optical isomers which are mirror images of one another and they're non super imposable so how do we know which one's which okay so the actually application of the optical isomerism is actually quite um, important um, that comes down to the synthetic um, um, drugs or medicines or whatever because um, like the example I gave you with the amino acids with the proteins um, there are the two isomers one of them are, in particular in some examples our body makes one particular version but we can't actually make that um, exact same thing we the, the, the chemists actually make the isomer the optical isomer of the of this of this particular protein and then um, then they do kind of similar sort of job okay so let's have a look at how we distinguish um, optical isomers from another okay so this is distinguishing distinguishing 
distinguishing optical isomers. Okay, so distinguishing optical isomers. So this is where you need to just remember this. All right, it's like one of those magic phrases, and I'll show you how it works. All right, so they will rotate the plane of polarized light in opposite directions. So one goes at clockwise, one goes anti-clockwise. Okay, so this is one of those um, phrases you just need to remember um, because they can't actually tell if you understand the phrase or not, And but I do want you to understand, so I'm gonna show you a clip um, to demonstrate how this thing works. Okay, so this is a clip that I normally show in the classroom, um, which is that one, okay? So as you can see, um, if we go back a little bit, um, so you can see the light that's coming in, these lights over here on the left hand side, light can go in all sorts of directions, okay? So in order to, um, not to say control the lights, but you, what you want to do is like you put these slits here, so only light that travels in a particular wavelength or you know, in a particular orientation, they have been um, polarized. So they go in, so the light that comes out from the other side, they only go in one particular direction. And, that, and that's, a, that's the same principle that works for um, some polarized sunglasses. Okay, so how do the sunglasses prevent the light from going into your eyes? Is that they kind of acting like the filter, just like the slits that you're looking at in the middle. They kind of filter out all the light that's not root, that's not going in this particular wavelength, you know, at this particular orientation. So that's what you're looking at is this, you know, this process of getting rid of all the other light, and then you have this plane of polarized light. And then if you shine this polarized light, you know, through the solution, so that as you can see, the light is going in the same in the same wavelength, same order, and then you shine that through the two liquid, you know, these two liquids are the optical isomers, and what they will do is that one of them will rotate it one direction, and the other one will rotate it in the other direction. So one goes clockwise, one goes anti-clockwise. And that is how we can actually determine what type of isomers, um, which one is which, okay? Because, and, and, and to go into more detail, that's going to university um, um, categories, but we, we will not go there. But you just need to understand that they will rotate the plane of polarized light, which is the resulting light that comes out of the slit, and then they will rotate them in opposite directions. Because they are dealing with light, and that's why we are um, looking, that's why it's called optical isomers, because you know, you can distinguish them with lights, okay? So so just give you an example of optical isomers, it doesn't have to be, um, it can be any other function group, okay? So let's like, say I can do this, you know, this is a common way of doing it, and this is something that you need to, let's like, say I can have a carboxylic acid like that, and this is my chirocarbon. Okay, and then or I can do, um, so, so you know, it, it, you just need to man, you just need to manipulate, you just need to manipulate your, you know, butan 2 always is a, is a uh, you can have optical isomers because this is my chirocarbon. So you can actually, not sure you can see what I'm doing, is that you can manipulate this quite easily. You just want your carbon to have four different groups. So you can give it, the easiest way is to give it a car hydrogen and give it a CH3. And then you can give it a CH2, CH3, and then you can just put the function group, whatever, on the left hand side. That's like the easiest way to go about it. Um, but sometimes it's a little bit trickier, but you know, if you were given a structure, uh, sorry, if you were given a, um, let's say for example, if, well, since it's already here, let's say for example, this one, right? So this is C4H, uh, 3, 10, um, C4, H10, no. okay, let me just double check my math, I failed my math, H11, no, can't count, um, okay, so C4, H11, no. and this is what some of the questions that 
they might even ask you. Wait, let me, I'm doubting myself now. It is 10, I was tripping. I was right. So I should never record these when I'm about to sleep. Okay, so C4, H10, R. So that's five, that's five. Okay, so they will give you this. So a question that you can get in the exam is something like that. And they go, okay, so we have got the molecular formula of C4, H10, R. And they go, okay, so draw me a molecule A that's going to, I'm not going to write the whole conditions down, right? But draw me molecular A that can react um, with amino formal, that can be reacting with um, amino four minus um, H plus, and then the product can turn the solution, uh, can turn Toland's reagent, can react with Toland's reagent and produce a silver mirror. So A must be what? A must be a primary alcohol. So you just manipulate this, so you go one, two, three, four, and then this has to be a primary alcohol. It doesn't have to look like that. You can put a um, you can put a carbon here if you want, you know, because as long as the OH is bonding to C, that's bonding to one C, it doesn't really matter. You can draw this, you can draw this. So sometimes there are multiple answers, so most of the time it's just one answer. Okay, so they go, okay, so they want to, to name that. And then for B, they go, okay, um, B is a molecule that have optical isomers um, and can be oxidized as well. So you need to go, okay, so I need to manipulate this. So how do I manipulate that? So I need my carbons, I have four carbons, so I can do it like that. And then I can do my H and I can do my OH, like the one I showed you just now. And that will give me my C4, uh, C5, uh, C4, H10, O, okay, C4, H10, O. And this is my car carbon. And they may ask you, they may ask you to draw the mirror images and they might ask you to draw the products of this oxidation. But this is just an example, all right? And this is quite an easy example compared to what they're gonna throw at you at the end of the examination. But you get the idea. It's, a, it's, never, it's, it's not an independent um, concept. It's often going to be mixed up with some other stuff, like mostly reactions, distinguishing tests, everything like that. That's why I often say, I love doing this type of question because I feel this is actually somewhat challenging because the rest is not, all right? Um, you know, because like you can memorize um, the periodic table trends. I mean, what's so challenging with that? You know, this is actually applying the knowledge that you've learned and solving puzzles. And, you know, that's something I personally enjoy. Okay, but, you know, with, with the optic isomers, you just need to remember chirocarbon, four different groups, um, draw it in, in a way that they're mirror images of each other and they're not superimposable and you can distinguish them by shining through a plane of polarized, uh, polarized light through the solutions and the one they wrote and they will rotate them in opposite directions. Okay, so that's all I have for you guys today and um, take care and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.